Imagine you decided to take a road trip the old-fashioned way. And by that, I mean you decide to do it without the help of any technology. What? So you go to the nearest convenience store and buy a map of each state you plan to pass through. You buckle them up on the passenger seat right next to you and set off on your adventure. During your first week, you arrive in the state of New York. You wave bye-bye to Lady Liberty, eat a slice of pizza, and head upstate. Near the Catskills, you notice you're running low on gas and decide to stop in the nearest town to fill up your tank. You check your map, and it appears that the nearest place is a small village called Aglo, right at the next intersection. You drive a few minutes and pass through a sign that says, Welcome to Aglo, home of the Aglo General Store. Well, this must be it, you think to yourself. But the town is strangely empty. You can't find the store or the gas station you were looking for. There are no houses. You start to think there might be a mistake. Aglo doesn't seem to exist. This story may sound made up, but it could have actually happened to anyone passing through New York a few years ago. Actually, the so-called town of Aglo is what is called a phantom settlement or a paper town. There are several of these around the world, but Aglo is probably the most famous. Paper towns are basically fake towns. That is, they don't really exist. They're made up of Easter eggs put there by map makers as a kind of copyright trap. Maps are tough to make. To create a map from scratch, one has to do years of field work or analysis of satellite photos. That's why plagiarism has always been rampant among map makers. It's pretty easy to redraw the same geographical features from one map onto a new map, and it is hard to get caught. People are, after all, drawing the exact same world. That's why map makers came up with a way to catch individuals stealing their data. Some map makers may include a mountain that is bigger than they are in reality. Others might add a slight turn on a road, where in reality there is none. For example, in the early 1970s, a fake mountain peak appeared on some Boulder County maps. The addition of this previously unknown peak, called Mount Richard, into local maps began to confuse Colorado rock climbers at the time. It turned out that Mount Richard was one of these copyright traps, put there by a local maps man called (laughs) Richard Siachi. Let's just say he must have decided to pay a tribute to himself with this little addition. Now, adding a paper town is perhaps one of the most extreme solutions, one that map makers hope goes unnoticed. But that's not what usually happens, which leads us back to the Aglo story. Map makers Ernest Alperts and Otto Lindbergh from the CDG, General Drafting Corporation, were part of the largest map publishers of the 1930s. Back then, the company was commissioned to create a map of the state of New York. That's when the two men had an idea. In order to prevent copyright infringement, they would create a phantom settlement combining parts of their names together. They came up with the strange name Aglo and added the fake town along Route 206 near the water reservoir of Catskills in upstate New York. The area was supposed to be, in reality, a dirt road. Years later, Rand McNally, another map designing company, produced a map of New York that included a town called Aglo in the same location where CDG had originally placed it. Lindbergh was convinced that he had a copyright case against his competitor, but the story just kept getting more complicated. Both companies went to settle the case in court. But as it turned out, McNally had a legitimate reason for adding Aglo to their version of a New York map. You see, in order to fabricate their maps, McNally did a thorough research on real estate and establishments located in each existing town. And as it turned out, Aglo was not an empty town when they drew their map. Records show that the town housed an establishment named Aglo General Store. Sure, it was the only building in town, but that was enough for the map makers to believe that such a town really existed. They added Aglo to the map like they would add any other town with physical establishments. It seemed they weren't infringing any copyright if this once phantom settlement had somehow come to life. The plot twist is that CDG's Alpers and Lindbergh could never have foreseen that someone would decide to occupy a made-up town. But it happened. One day, someone bought a map from a regional gas station that had Aglo marked on it. The person wanted to open a store more or less where Aglo existed, so they decided to name the store after the town it was in. 
They trusted the accuracy of the map they bought and named their business Aglo General Store. After all, why would there be a non-existent town on an official map? The general store didn't last many years, only enough to turn this story into a mess. On the bright side, <laughs> this whole debacle turned Aglo into a super-famous fictitious settlement. It became a tourist spot, with people driving from all over the U.S. to get a picture of the town's welcome sign. Now, as we said before, paper towns are plenty around the world and over time, too. A 2005 BBC documentary revealed that the city of London alone had over 100 tiny fake streets or paper streets around the city. For instance, the so-called Moat Lane is supposedly a curving road in Finchley, North London. But if you ever decide to go visit, you'll find nothing but trees and gardens. And what about Argleton, a town in the north of England? Or more accurately, an empty field in northeastern England? Argleton existed for a while on Google Maps. There were hotel listings and apartments for rent in town. Well, the only thing is that they weren't really in Argleton, but rather in nearby settlements. It's believed that Google Maps imported these fake streets into its database as they used renowned copyrighted atlases as their sources. But as the truth about these paper streets surfaced, the company later deleted them. If we turn back the clock a few hundred years, we'll find another mystery story involving a possible phantom settlement. But this isn't a tiny town at an intersection, but rather an entire island. Bermejo Island was speculated to be a tiny inhabited island. It appeared on many maps of the 16th and 17th centuries and was a hot spot for Spanish explorers. Its location sometimes varied slightly from map to map, and occasionally, its name appeared as Vermija, but its existence seemed certain enough. It wasn't until the 18th century that the island stopped being depicted in maps altogether. This island's last appearance dates back to a 1921 edition of a Mexican atlas, and then poof! It dropped out of the horizon altogether. The case of Mexico's disappeared island has raised many questions. Did it sink? Was it destroyed? Are people simply looking for it in the wrong place? Three official investigations took place in 2009 to locate the island. They used high-end technologies, scouring Mexico's oceans and seabeds. Yet, Bermija remained nowhere to be found. One can't help but wonder if the island ever existed at all. Similar to modern-day mapmakers, 16th and 17th century mapmakers had their way to trick map users. Instead of copyright traps, these fake towns or even fake islands served as a way to fool and confuse enemies and unwanted voyagers. Since a long time has gone by, it's hard to know whether Bermija was just another phantom settlement. It stopped being depicted on maps, but this mysterious case still leaves people baffled and confused. Behind those huge steel doors is one of the most guarded places on Earth. It's known as Site R, or the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. You'll find it in Pennsylvania. The construction is 60 stories underground. and is said to be a safe place for people in case of a natural or human-made disaster. There's not a lot of information online about this mysterious place, but what we do know is that it's equipped with 38 communication systems. It's obviously not available for visits via Google Earth, but you can catch a quick glance at the two gates that face the complex. Vatican City is one of the most famous enclaves on Earth, and it's certainly worth a visit due to its wonderful architecture and vast list of art pieces to check out. One place, however, will always be off-limits for visitors – the Vatican's secret archives. They have some of the oldest and rarest books on Earth. These archives are available only to a limited number of people, and since they have been visited by a small number of people so far, they also trigger a lot of weird theories. For example, that there may be books proving there's life outside our planet. If you're fascinated by shipwrecks, you'll be interested to know that one of the largest wrecks you can see on Google Earth is on North Sentinel Island, India. It used to be called the SS Jasim. It was a Bolivian ferry that sank in the area back in 2003. The reason why people can't visit it physically isn't because of the ship itself, but because the island is home to the world's most dangerous tribe. We don't really know how many people live there, but it was estimated that between 50 to 400 people call this place home, and they really don't like tourists. No person that tried to reach them survived. 
Also, to protect them, their privacy, and their special status, the island is closely monitored by the Indian authorities. That's mostly because it's believed the locals don't have any immunity to modern diseases. So being in contact with foreigners might be dangerous for the tribe's people, since they've never seen the outer world. A huge pink bunny appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the Italian Coletto Fava Mountains back in 2005. Besides the locals, some people stumbled upon it online too. They were puzzled by the discovery. Unfortunately, that 200-foot tall bunny is completely gone today. You can still find the images of it online, though. The unusual object was designed by artists from Vienna. They encourage tourists to climb, jump, or even take a nap on top of the large rabbit. The whole purpose of the project was to allow people to experience what it would be like to live as smaller creatures. The bunny didn't have any removal date at the time it was placed there and was expected to last at least until 2025. But Mother Nature had other plans. A Japanese artist decided to move back to her little home village named Nagoro. But she soon found out that most of her neighbors were moving to bigger cities. To deal with loneliness, she started putting together scarecrow-like dolls, or kakashi, and placing them all over her garden. She didn't stop there, though. The artist soon began doing the same with many other places in her village, creating dolls and placing them as if they were taking part in various human activities. These dolls keep moving around too, but the woman likes to stay true to her story and insists she doesn't touch them. You can see the images of this quirky village on Google Maps. This weird portal was discovered via online maps in New Baltimore, New York. It gave people all sorts of bad dreams. With spooky-looking buildings and all sorts of blurry figures, this area soon became a source for many weird internet theories. Turns out it was nothing more than a technical issue which resulted in those images being rendered in a distorted manner. Either way, if you look for these images on Google, you won't be able to unsee them. This cute miniature world map was created by an artist from Denmark. He continuously worked on this tedious project from 1944 until 1967, using mostly his hands and just a few tools for moving heavy rocks around. He gathered stones at the edge of the water, then recreated the map of the world on the surface of this lake. During the winter, he was able to use a sled to transport larger pieces of rock over the ice and then place them in the perfect position. Apart from the continents themselves, the map also features rivers and lakes, as well as some other famous landmarks. Care to have a look at a sea without any coasts? Search for the Sargasso Sea. You'll find it in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This weird sea is surrounded by four ocean currents and no dry land at all. It got its name from the seaweed that grows there, Sargasso. Fingerprints on the lens of a satellite camera? You may be tricked into thinking this if you search for the finger maze. It's located in the city of Brighton, UK, and is a large fingerprint created in Hove Park. It also has a maze at the center. It can be really hard and time-consuming to look for wild animals on Google Earth, but the Geo Browser does have a nice feature that can help if you're eager to see hippos and flamingos in their natural habitat. Try Googling animals from above and start scrolling through these images. This unique feature can take you from Kenya to Namibia and even all the way to Antarctica, where you can see emperor penguins. There are some places on Google Maps that, for specific reasons, aren't available for the online public. Like the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. If you head over there via Google Earth, you'll see that everything around the Dutch Royal Palace is still visible, like the vegetation and roads. But the construction itself is blurred from all angles. That's probably because local authorities want to keep the unique views of the palace for the eyes of physical visitors only. The same goes for the Tantaco National Park in Chile. This one is a privately owned nature reserve that can only be seen on Google Maps from a distance. Once you reach a certain point, the zoom feature stops working. Some people say that since it's a nature preserve, it may be home to some endangered species and extreme measures are taken for their protection. You know how a certain brand of fried chicken has a certain kernel on their logo? Yeah, you won't see any of these logos in high resolution on Google Maps. That's because the online map uses specific algorithms to detect people's faces and blur them out. As you can see, it's not always really that accurate. It's called Snake Island, and the Brazilian authorities prohibit people from visiting it. For good reason. You'll find the island near the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's said to be home to over 4,000 snakes. Some of the most venomous types of reptiles on Earth call this place home. If that's not creepy enough, how about that some of them are so dangerous that a small drop of their venom 
can permanently damage the human skin. You can see the shape of the island on Google Earth, but the more you zoom in, the blurrier it becomes. Here's another cool thing you can do on Google Earth. Time travel! Well, at least sort of. You won't be able to travel back in time and tell yourself to study more for that tricky exam, but you can see certain historical images of places you like. You can check if this feature works by looking at the upper left corner of the screen. If you can see a small icon with a clock, it may allow you to scroll some years back. But you can also see how sunlight affects Earth if you turn on the sunlight feature. They used to call this island the Paris of the East, mostly because it had beautiful buildings with large gardens and impressive stone archways. But now, it's nothing like it used to be, with all the architecture almost entirely covered in tree roots and vines. Ross Island is a small territory in the Indian Ocean. It's located east of the Indian city of Port Blair. Though initially thought of as a jail, Ross Island eventually became a luxurious resort for the local administrators. They called this island a real treat for its more privileged residents. It boasted opulent bungalows, stained glass window panels brought all the way from Italy, neatly kept gardens, tennis courts, and even swimming pools. Soon after the complex was closed in 1937, a powerful earthquake hit the island. It caused a lot of damage, making it even more uninhabitable. The island is now in the administration of India and has become a tourist attraction for people interested in abandoned towns. Pieces of German architecture still lie hidden in the Namibian desert. The city of Kolmanskop, Namibia, was a luxury location at its peak in the early 1900s when German workers settled here looking for diamonds. This abandoned town used to have everything from a ballroom to a hospital and even a bowling alley. It all started to decline somewhere in the late 1910s when another diamond-packed location was found nearby. So most of the people living here moved leaving everything behind in search of more money. Kolmanskop has since been slowly occupied by sand dunes, while the hot temperature and low moisture help to preserve the buildings. This ghost town is also available for visitors. If it sounds interesting, you can book a tour in the nearby town of Luderitz. Another abandoned castle dominates the view in Krakow, a city in Italy. The whole village sits atop a cliff that's 1,312 feet high. The founders liked this location since they knew it would be easy to defend themselves from unwanted guests. But the castle, built in the 1300s, soon became overwhelmed by landslides and earthquakes. Even though it has no residents anymore, the medieval city often comes alive during the various local festivals that take place here in the summer months. The locals also offer tours and tell amazing stories about the location. One of the highlights of the tour is a statue that seemingly came out of nowhere and now lies in a body of water. Hidden away in the Montana mountains, Garnet Ghost Town tells the well-known American story of the West's Gold Rush. The town's history goes back to the 1890s when they found a lot of gold in the Nancy Hanks mine. During its glory days, Garnet had almost 1,000 residents. Even though it's in a relatively secluded location, it had saloons, hotels, stores, a school, and other features of a regular little town. In 1905, when most of the gold had already been taken away, most mines were left behind, so only a couple of hundred residents stayed in Garnet. The final straw came in 1912, when a fire damaged most of the town's buildings. So, by the 1940s, Garnet was completely abandoned. It soon became a hotspot for treasure hunters looking for furnishings and artifacts. That was until a preservation campaign started in the 1970s. It ended with the town being declared a historic district in 2010. To this day, Garnet is one of the best preserved ghost towns in the area. Hashima Island is another abandoned location that tells us that when people leave, nature takes over. This mysterious place was even featured in a James Bond movie because of its ghostly landscape. It used to be a well-known spot in Japan for undersea coal mines as it was opened in 1881. In 1959, at its peak, there were over 5,000 people living here. 
including mine workers and their families. As soon as the mines started going dry, sometime in 1970, people started to slowly depart the island, leaving it completely abandoned in three months. Even though nobody lives there these days, there are a lot of tourists here that drop off to wander around the abandoned homes, swimming pools, stores, and factories. Another town that started with a mining company back in 1881 is Calico, California. People discovered the location was packed with silver, so it soon became home to over 500 silver mines and 3,000 residents. It used to feature hotels, general stores, restaurants, and a school. There was even a local newspaper printed here called the Calico Print. But by 1986, the town had become empty. One of the former locals decided to buy it and began its restoration, making it a registered historical landmark. It even has a museum of the Old West available for tourists. One of the most interesting attractions that were rebuilt is the one mile long Calico and Odessa Railroad. It currently goes through the steep canyons and hills and even passes the old mines and buildings north of Calico. Approximately one third of the town is original all the rest consists of newer buildings that are replicas meant to recreate the spirit of its past. If you're a fan of cars, you might have heard of Henry Ford as the famous American industrialist who founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903. But in 1927, he began working on another one of his ambitious dreams, Fordlandia. It was supposed to be a massive rubber plantation located near the Tapajos River in Brazil since he needed a reliable source of rubber for his car tires and hoses. His vision was to design a town complete with swimming pools, a golf course, living bungalows, and even weekly square dancing sessions for the locals. This project was unfortunate to begin with, since the local rubber trees soon got infected with leaf fungus. Even though Henry Ford invested a staggering $20 million into this potential income source, the town failed to produce the needed rubber. He had nothing left to do but to sell it to Brazil in 1945. And soon, it was completely abandoned. Many of its buildings are still standing, but have been taken over by the surrounding nature. You can still see curious tourists wandering through it to this day. During its glory days, Hampi was the second largest city in the world. Looking at its ruins today, it's hard to imagine this Indian city used to be filled with temples and bazaars and that it served as an important center of the Mauryan Empire in the 14th and 15th centuries. It was destroyed in the 16th century, but it still has beautifully preserved forts and markets. It became part of the UNESCO World Heritage in 1986, aiming to protect its buildings, such as the Lotus Mahal, a stone structure that was carved to resemble a lotus flower opening to the sun. A tourist village was constructed back in 1920 along the shore of Epicuan, a salt lake about 370 miles southwest of Buenos Aires in Argentina. It was designed to provide people with a busy city life a breath of fresh air near the restorative salt waters of the nearby lake. It was soon equipped with a railroad station and ended up having a population of more than 5,000 residents. The project was also destined to fail soon enough as the unusual amount of rain at that time caused Lake Epicuan to swell. In 1985, the water took over the local dam and the town was flooded. The waters were so deep that they even reached a depth of 33 feet in 1993. They only began to recede in 2009 and left behind the remaining buildings, literally encrusted in salt. No one came back to the town except for Pablo Novak, who returned here back in 2012 and was the only resident of Villa Epicuan at the time. It was April 10th, 1912. Richard had just departed from Southampton, England, aboard the most famous ship of the time, dubbed the Unsinkable. Since he had just witnessed a near collision with the SS City of New York, he decided to write to his wife and report the unfortunate and frightening event. My dearest Sal, he wrote, we got away yesterday after a lot of trouble. Little did he know that a mere four days later, both his pen and the ship he was on would be lost forever at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Was this some sort of bad omen? Did Richard actually foresee what was about to happen to the ship he was on? 
in case you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Richard Geddes was aboard the Titanic on the day that he wrote the letter to his wife. On April 14, 1912, the ship seemed to have been lost forever. Along with it, so many secrets and treasures have settled at the bottom of the ocean. It took until 1985 for the Titanic's wreck to be finally rediscovered using state-of-the-art sonar technology. Ever since then, they've managed to recover thousands of items from the Titanic, and many of them went on display or auction. Things like jewelry, a life jacket, a menu from the ship's restaurant, or even a sample square of carpet from the first-class stateroom have all captivated the public's attention, just like the many stories of the people on board. Scientists have even tried to come up with strategies to get the Titanic back up altogether to properly study it and stop it from getting more and more damaged at the bottom of the ocean. Some have suggested filling the wreck with ping pong balls to make it float, while others even considered injecting it with 180,000 tons of Vaseline. Another idea was to use 450,000 tons of liquid nitrogen to trap it in an iceberg that would float to the surface. But they eventually had to let go of all these potential strategies, since the Titanic is way too fragile to ever be recovered. The Titanic may be one of the most interesting ships lying at the bottom of the ocean, at least in popular culture, but deep sea divers have a lot of other stories to share. Planes also sometimes find their way to the bottom of the ocean. Deep sea divers in Oahu, Hawaii came across the wreckage of an F4U Corsair plane. It seems to have crashed into the ocean in 1946, as it didn't have sufficient fuel. If you can dive deep enough, you might even stumble upon statues and lost artifacts, like those found in the world's only underwater archaeological park off the coast of Naples, Italy. It features the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Baia. The underwater statues found here are breathtaking, to say the least. In an ironic twist of events, some of the equipment we intended to use to get us to the moon was lost at the bottom of the sea for a very long time. But how did that happen? Beginning from the late 1960s and ending in the early 70s, many Apollo rockets were launched to orbit the Earth and the moon. When reaching altitudes of about 38 miles, the first portion of the spacecraft, including the engines, needed to separate. People thought these components got destroyed or lost forever. But were they really? In 2012, a team of specialists discovered a bunch of rocket engines 14,000 feet off the coast of Florida. They have since gone through a two-year renovation plan and are now on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Can you imagine stumbling upon a whole city underwater? Back in 2001, a lost city was discovered in the Gulf of Cambay off the coast of India. Some archaeologists believe it to be the oldest city in history. By comparison, it's almost the size of Manhattan and features massive walls and even plazas. They stumbled upon pieces of sculpture, artwork, and even what looked like ancient wooden furniture, believed to date back up to 9,500 years ago and 5,000 years older than any city previously discovered. Okay, how about an underwater river? I can't even imagine what that would look like, but some deep divers claim to have seen it south of Tulum, Mexico. Is that even possible? Well, not really, since the Cenote Angelita Cave is not a true river, but a very special type of optical illusion. It's formed by a halocline, meaning a cloud of hydrogen sulfide at the bottom of this underwater cave. Turns out you can actually swim right through this cloud, which makes you feel like you're swimming through a flowing body of water. Not all things discovered underwater are inanimate objects. Some of them are actually quite scary sea creatures. A jellyfish might not be on your list of things to look out for if you can avoid the stings. But this giant one, also known as a lion's mane jellyfish, is the largest known species of its kind. In all fairness, you'll only uncover it if you happen to dive into the waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. You surely won't miss it, since it stretches across 120 feet from the top to the bottom of its tentacles. When it comes to deep sea diving, a lot of people are looking to discover some lost treasure. One diver was lucky enough to have hit the literal jackpot when he came upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure on the bottom of the seabed. That was back in 2015, 
when this lucky diver was swimming just off the coast of Florida. What did he find, you might ask? Well, about 51 gold coins, 40 feet of gold chain, and a rare single coin that was tailored for the King of Spain, Philip V. Speaking of people looking for lost treasures, divers also sometimes found pirate ships. They discovered one of these pirate shipwrecks in 2015 off the coast of Colombia. It dates back to the 18th century. The value of this forgotten ship was estimated to be between $4 billion and $17 billion, as it contained treasures, precious stones, gold, and countless other really valuable items. By comparison, a whole island in the Bahamas is up for grabs at $75 million. A computer is the last thing you'd ever expect to discover underwater, right? And this was no regular computer, but an ancient one. And yet, someone stumbled upon it between 1900 and 1901 on the spot of a shipwreck located off one Greek island. Researchers believe this weird stone contraption to be the earliest form of a computer. It was designed to serve many purposes, such as predicting astronomical positions and eclipses on the calendar. Since humanity lost most of the technology used back then, it was wonderful to rediscover it so many years later. It let us piece together many of the ancient Greeks' accomplishments. The computer is now at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, should you ever want to check it out in person. This has to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the Earth's oceans. We really don't know how deep it is, since it's so difficult to measure. But it's somewhere around 7 miles deep, and 5 times longer than the Grand Canyon. They first studied this massive underwater hole back in 1875, using a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director named James Cameron reached the bottom of the trench in the submersible vessel Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet call this place their home, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench took its name after the nearby Mariana Islands, which are named Las Marianas in honor of the Spanish queen Mariana of Austria. Well, looky here. It's New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, Hong Kong on the Hudson, the greatest city in the world, New York, New York, the city so nice they named it twice. All right, I'll stop. You thought you knew this city so well, but underneath all that glitz and glamour is a facade, literally. New York is populated with some of the most iconic urban buildings in the world and home to some of the most unique and famous towers. Who would have known that New York was a front for fake buildings? And the cool thing is that there are plenty to search for. Okay, I'm adding that to my bucket list. So the question is, why do they put these fake buildings all over New York? The city is one of the most vibrant places in the world and requires many infrastructures to keep the city in motion. That means having many industrial structures and buildings in every major district. New York is charming for the design and the buildings. Imagine having industrial structures right next to your favorite pizza parlor or hot dog stand. The designers thought ahead and decided to disguise those industrial infrastructures as fake buildings. They blend with the city so well that they don't stand out. They look like your good old apartment or housing unit with a front door, real-life windows, and even charming balconies where people would hang out. The only thing is that there's nothing behind the facade and no one is allowed inside. So where in the world can you find these fake buildings? For starters, one of the most popular fake buildings is in Brooklyn. At 58 Giralamont Street, you can find a very typical neighborhood. But between the buildings stands a brick building with a slightly deeper shade than the rest. It has bright open windows that blend in with the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood, except that they're blacked out. At first glance, you might not think of it as anything. But if you pay close attention, the building looks like a glitch from a video game. It was built in 1847, way before New York was considered glamorous. Originally, it was meant to be a regular building, but in 1908, they converted it into a fake building. Don't think you can just try to break in. Even if you could, it's pointless, because it's part of a ventilation fan for the subway. It also serves as an emergency exit for some of the surrounding buildings. Actually, throughout New York, many fake buildings exist to disguise the subway vents for the smoke to escape. 
All the way to 415 Bruckner Boulevard, the Bronx, this townhouse was designed by the Switzer Group, which is an interior architect company. It's not as charming as the one at 58 Jorah Lemon Street, but it serves a similar purpose – to hide an electric substation for New York's utility company. The city needs these substations to reduce the high-voltage electricity to a lower voltage so it can be distributed locally. Having a building like this popping out of the middle of your neighborhood isn't exactly the smartest way to attract people to the Bronx. That's why the fake townhouse facade is the perfect camouflage. Now, some of these fake buildings don't really hit the mark and stick out like a sore thumb. The people of Manhattan described the Mulry Square infrastructure as a complete clunker. After plenty of redesigns and back to the drawing board meetings, the result is still not pretty. The locals compare it to a concrete box. They created windows without glass, which doesn't allow the building to blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. But it beats a typical subway ventilation plant either way. There are just so many places to visit and cross off your bucket list. But if you live in China, you can literally stay in the country and visit many iconic cities around the world. The replica cities began when the Chinese economy started booming in the early 90s. They wanted the lifestyle of the rich and famous without wanting to leave their country. They can be comfortable eating their local food and get the feeling of being abroad. The Chinese province of Guangdong has an identical copy of the historical Australian alpine village Hallstatt. The real Hallstatt is centuries old and one of the most charming places to discover. The local people of Hallstatt also had no idea that their home was being built in China. Some people thought that this was controversial, probably because it cost around $940 million to build it. Paris is undoubtedly one of the most charming cities you could ever visit. Its rich history and vibrant culture are enough to catch the first plane to go there. For residents of Tian du Cheng, that's something they can do anytime they want. The city is also known as Sky City and has a replica of the Eiffel Tower that looks eerily like the iconic one in Paris and built buildings to match the city's visual charm. One of the main things that will break the charm is the farmland surrounding the city. There's barely anyone there, and the streets are always empty, very un-Paris-like. Still, you can find some nice fountains and statues scattered along the streets to give it some spirit. There's laundry hung everywhere, even on the trees. The picturesque fountains are dry and many apartments are empty. Only a few stores are open for business. Even though this looks like a fake city, it's quite real. Some people live here because it's more affordable than other places. Two hours away from this town is another version of Paris's Pont Alexandre III and a carbon copy of London's Tower Bridge, but with four towers instead of two. Hey, such a bargain! You can also visit the closest thing to Italy, but this time you can go shopping. Florentia Village is an outlet mall that offers an array of shops to lose yourself. The good thing is that this was built by an Italian developer to capture the essence of an Italian village. It has fountains, canals, and mosaics for proper aesthetics. It began in 2011 and has more than 200 shops with many Italian brands and British, US, and Chinese brands as well. The place is so popular that it gets between 10,000 and 25,000 visitors per day. China also has other replica towns that put you in a mini Manhattan called the Yu Jiapu Financial District. The developer's goal was to make this place the financial center of the world. It was complete with the right landmarks, like the Rockefeller and Lincoln Centers, but the project was halted in 2019, leaving it mainly empty. You can find a typical English town with cobbled streets, Victorian homes, and restaurants that make Thames Town. This place was meant to recreate a European lifestyle fantasy without leaving Shanghai. China also has a Dutch town that has some elements of Amsterdam with windmills and famous canals. They even decided to copy some of the landmarks, like the Netherlands Maritime Museum. Here's a bonus story of Lebanon's thinnest building built out of a dispute. It's the story of two brothers who both inherited unequal plots of land. One of the brothers happened to get a very thin plot of land and couldn't help but be jealous of his brother's nice plot of land. He wasn't pleased. 
Both of the lands overlook the Mediterranean Sea in a lively neighborhood of Beirut. So it's no wonder that both brothers couldn't agree on how they should develop their lands. It was obvious that the brother with the most land could build a proper building. The other brother had to improvise. He decided to obstruct his brother's property by constructing a thin building enough to only fit 14 feet at its widest and 2 feet at its most narrow. It was constructed in 1954, and the locals of the area know it as the Grudge. The crazy thing is that the place was once habitable with many visitors enjoying their stay. It's not easy to live there, but it's part of living the experience. The building is still standing, but is empty. Welcome to No, a small town located in the south of Seward Peninsula on the west coast of Alaska. If you live here, I'll bet you say there's no place like No. Well, maybe not. It's cold and snowy here, and no roads connect this town with other settlements. And with the onset of night, locals have disappeared here without a trace. Perhaps that's why only 3,500 people live here. Well, let's investigate this case. People disappear in cities for assorted reasons. But it was Nome who attracted the attention of the public. From 1960 to 2004, some 24 people went missing there. That number is statistically too big for such a small population. People just didn't come home in the morning, and no one knew what had happened to them. All the locals in small towns like Nome know each other. There are almost no strangers here, as it's difficult to get to Nome. There are no roads and no ferry crossing. All roads from Nome break off and lead to beautiful natural landscapes unspoiled by human mammals. You can get there and back by plane. And this is not some passenger jet, but a small biplane. Another way to get there is by snowmobile. By the way, Nome is the ultimate point of the famous dog sled race, the Iditarod. Also, you can pay locals from neighboring villages and towns to bring you to Nome by motorboat. But despite this, the town has become quite famous. The frequent disappearance of people finally got needed attention. The whole world found out about Nome, and in 2009, Hollywood even made a movie about it. For a long time, no one could solve the mystery. The police had no clues, no witnesses, nothing. There are long, cold nights here in winter, and the air becomes so cold that a glass of water freezes in minutes. Snow can fall constantly. Therefore, if someone leaves the town at night, snow will sweep all traces away by the morning. Of course, people began to come up with their own theories. The most popular one was about someone who took people away by force. The police didn't find any evidence that some person could do it. So, if it's not a human, it could be some beast. And again, police found no evidence to support this version. After that, people started thinking that creatures from other planets caused these disappearances. Many locals were sure that the town was a popular destination for extraterrestrial spaceships. The plot of the Hollywood movie The Fourth Kind was based on this version. More time passed. Finally, the police and the FBI launched a large-scale investigation, and they uncovered the truth. They realized that the stories about missing people were exaggerated. The popularity of Gnome and the constant talk about fantastic things made people believe in the reality of these versions. Now, let's assume that some of the appearances were made up. But still, many people are gone. What about them? The answer is bars and harsh weather. Entertainment venues are open at night. Some locals have fun, leave the bar, and go home. At this moment, a heavy snowstorm begins. Visibility drops to zero and the strong wind knocks you down. This way, a person might simply get lost. And that's it. The truth turned out stranger than most versions. The Bermuda Triangle is a big area in the Atlantic Ocean, so the disappearance of ships and planes there seems not so surprising. But it's much creepier when it happens on a lake Let's visit the Lake Michigan Triangle. It's located between Michigan and Wisconsin. 
for a couple of centuries, terrible things have been happening here. People put the same legends around this place as around the Bermuda Triangle. They reported unexplained phenomena and saw flying objects above the lake surface. Some believe that the triangle is a time portal. Of course, no theories have been confirmed, but strange cases have occurred on the Triangle territory. One happened in 1950, when a Northwest Airlines plane with 108 passengers disappeared without a trace during a flight over the lake. Police officers saw a red light over the lake two hours after the plane's last communication. The aircraft probably crashed, but rescuers didn't find any passengers or wreckage. All that's left was just an oil stain on the water. Many ships and boats disappeared there. But one of the strangest cases occurred on April 28, 1937. It was midnight. One ship was sailing through this lake. Captain George Donner went to sleep in his cabin after a hard day's work. Three hours later, the vessel was approaching the port. One of the crew members went to the captain's cabin to wake him up. The door was locked from the inside. The assistant knocked, but no one answered. When he suspected that something had happened to the captain, the assistant unlocked the door. He got into the cabin, but there was no captain there. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The crew couldn't find him. Since then, the eerie disappearance of Captain George Donner remains unexplained. Meet David Paulides. In 2008, he finished his career as a police officer and began to study the mysterious disappearance of people in Europe, the USA, and Canada. He found out that most people went missing in the U.S. national parks. Over the past 150 years, more than 1,100 tourists have vanished there. Many of them were experienced travelers who knew how to survive in harsh wild conditions. David has written about these mysterious vanishings. He pointed out that some of them didn't disappear but were found alive. They woke up somewhere in the forest and didn't remember what had happened to them. The creepy detail of all these cases is that most missing persons were young. Another detail is that many went missing before hurricanes. There are too many riddles and not enough answers in this case. Then there's the Sargasso Sea in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the only sea that doesn't have shores on land. It's called the sea only because it's defined by ocean currents. Also, golden brown algae grow in this area's bottom, making it seem like an orange spot in the middle of the endless ocean. The Sargasso Sea became famous because, in the 19th century, one of the most famous phantom ships in history sailed here. In 1872, a brigantine sailed through the Sargasso Sea. Its captain spotted another ship a few miles away. He lit a signal fire but received no response. Then the captain decided to sail closer to find out what had happened. On the hull of the mysterious ship was the name Mary Celeste. The captain of the brigantine and several crew members went on board. They walked around the deck and looked into the cabins and the hold. Everything was in place, but there were no people. The cargo and barrels remained untouched, so pirates didn't attack the vessel. The only damaged thing on the ship were the sails. They were torn to shreds. All documents except the logbook were missing from the navigator's cabin. The last logbook entry was added on November 24, 1872. The crew of the ship was never found, and this was one of many cases. In the 20th century, from the 60s to the 80s, there were many reports of empty boats and yachts floating on the sea. Also, some entire ships disappeared without a trace. All these cases still remain a mystery. According to one version, the four-sided current forms water funnels. Whirlpools can quickly pull a ship into the depths of the sea. This explains the disappearance of boats. But what about cases when the vessel is still on the water without a crew? Sometimes these whirlpools can create wind vortices. They're like little tornadoes. What if these whirlwinds are powerful enough to throw people overboard and tear the sails? Yeah, the theory seems too fantastic. So, what do you think happened?